In this The Wall Within Alpha exclusive preview, we are looking at all the eight dungeons coming to Mythic Plus and The Wall Within. I'll be covering every dungeon, the bosses, as well as all the special loot you can get in all the eight dungeons come The Wall Within. So you folks will also get to see some exclusive screenshots that they included in the media kit that will give you a very good sense of how the dungeons look, how the, some of the bosses and their arenas look like. Remember, this is the alpha, so things are subjected to change. Let's dive right in. As you can see on screen, the adventure guide from the alpha shows eight dungeons. I think similar to Dragonflight, we'll get eight new dungeons on launch for M-Zeros. Naturally, season one will probably be four of them. Coupled with four of the old dungeons from previous expansions, Season 2 is the other four, plus four other old dungeons. And I think in Season 3, that's where they released a new mega dungeon. I suspect that is the same cadence. They did not say anything in those closed door interviews that I've been part of that suggests that they are changing Mythic Plus in any other way when it comes to the approach for the dungeons. But this is just my guess. But let's start with the very first dungeon, Arakara, City of Echoes. So right off the bat, you can see this is a very Nerubian-esque dungeon. And even from the boss's name, you know that it's Nerubian flavored. Now, before we talk about the bosses as well as the loot that you will get, Blizzard also gave us exclusive screenshots as part of our media kit that we can share. So I'm gonna just show them on screen here. We'll kind of go through them and just quickly talk about them. So on screen here, you see some of the Nerubian dungeon kind of screenshots. Very reminiscent of the Wrath of the Lich King Nerubian dungeon, actually. So the color palette here that they chosen is clearly a mixture of deep purple, a bit of bluish tinge, which is very fitting for a, you know, spider-esque dungeon that is full of mystery and danger. The most telling of which is all these spider cobwebs that you see. And the eerie atmosphere is kind of accentuated by all these braziers that you see. This is after all supposed to be the deepest part of the entire new area that we are going to in the war within. The deepest, most darkest part of the entire new continent, if I can even call it. We already know that Zalathef is kind of in cahoots with the Nerubian, potentially leading them. A lot of prophecies about her being the old god or the fifth old god, but time will tell. The next screenshot here shows that the Nerubian also are kind of sentient, right? They have some sort of alchemical table and they're crafting something, I'm not sure. Probably their work orders. And it's very clear this dude will probably be a patrol. And you see this mob here, probably an interruptible mob, just based off Wrath of the Lich King kind of dungeons. Then we transit into probably more of the inner sanctum, and you see the colored palette shifting to a bit more ruby red. And you see these massive alchemical flasks to the side, no idea what they are, but my sense tells me that they are kind of extracting something. And there's definitely more humanoidish mobs over here. This is probably one of the bosses on that boss platform, you can tell from this bluish kind of figure here. We don't know who the boss is. And this is the other angle, right? Coming down the stairs and, you know, from behind the boss. This is definitely, I don't know whether it's the final boss, but we will tell. It's probably the inner sanctum, so it does make sense if this is the boss. Another very tight corridor over here. And then you see a new mob. This is a massive, massive mob that is probably patrolling the corridors. If you ask me, this kind of mob's probably very melee heavy hitting tank buster-ish kind of mob. Again, you see those spider patterns that is replicated not only on the walls as kind of decals, but also via the windows here that have like the spidery web kind of feel. And then another boss room from what I can tell. Again, the ruby red pet with the emerald green kind of hues as we enter the inner sanctum. You will also see this color palette that is replicated in the raid. And speaking about the raid, I also have a dedicated video covering all the bosses of the raid all the exclusive screenshots from the raid, the very first Nerubian raid that you get to expect come launch of the War Within. So it's already live on this channel, make sure to check it out. There's a playlist to all my alpha content in the description as well. This is another angle of the boss arena. So you probably need to come down the stairs. You can see these slime mobs that probably needs to be pulled before you actually spawn the boss, maybe very similar to the Azir vaults in terms of how you need to clear out the slimes first. And this is probably where the boss waits for you. My guess is you enter the arena, clear the slimes, the boss jumps down and engages you. But this is probably the final boss. All right, so that's Arakara City of Echoes. Let's now talk about the bosses before we talk about their various loot. First boss, Avanox. By the way, this is a three boss dungeon. So I think a lot of people enjoy shorter dungeons. And I think Blizzard might be trying to kind of adapt that going into Mythic Plus for the next season. A bit of placeholder text as the lore of Avanox over here. And what it says is, Avanox consumes with voracious bite and signals the staff crawlers with alerting shrill that grow in hunger over time. So let's break it down. It jumps to target, bites them, deals immense physical damage, 
And every time you get bitten, you take increasing amounts of damage. So you want to pop a defensive towards the end of the bite for sure. Healers just need to top you up, especially towards the end of the cast. And then it seems like it spawns ads, right? With alerting Shrill, it lets out a loud screech, alerts nearby crawlers, inflicts physical damage to all players. Unavoidable physical damage, it seems. Naturally can be cheesed using like bobs and stuff. So these crawlers seem to grow in hunger. It says fixates a random player and increases damage done by 25% every 3 seconds. It says random player, but this is really on the mobs, the staff crawler. So you can't just tunnel the boss. It's likely it's a ad management kind of boss. You need to work on killing the staff crawlers as they get stronger with DPS over time due to this hunger stack. Evernox then releases Gosama Onslaught and causes additional Undercrawler eggs to fall from above. Val Webbing serves as the perfect trap for her prey. So Gosama Onslaught, 4 seconds cast, it throws Toxic Web in all directions, inflicts nature damage over time to players, leaves Val Webbing at the target's location, inflicting 1.6 million nature damage to all players within 5 yards of the impact. So there are probably swirlies you need to dodge, which is the Val Webbing. And it says standing on this Val Webbing reduces your movement speed, inflicts a lot of nature damage over time. At 10 stacks, the webbing develops into a web wrap. And I think web wrap needs to be broken out of. You need to DPS the web wrap. Very standard kind of spider in the Rubia mechanic here. Voracious Bite seems to be a tank buster, by the way. I stand corrected. And tanks just need to pick up the staff crawlers. So every Voracious Bite tanks just pop cooldowns and pick up ads for tanks. DPS dealers probably need to just kill the staff crawlers, it seems. That's the assignment. Healers then need to do healing cooldowns so alerting Shrill, which is the unavoidable physical damage, as well as the Gosama Onslaught, which is nature damage. AOE white and just heal the tank on Voracious Bite. Fairly standard first boss, very simple. Let's cover the loot at one go. Let's move on to the next boss and we'll cover loot later on. And then we have Anoop Zek and there are a lot of placeholder text here which is Warstorm but you know we can always get a better sense by looking at the abilities directly. The models are not completed yet FYI. So this is a very standard beetle fight, right? The fact that it has impale, you already know. It's probably a frontal corner impale kind of spikes that travels out. You just need to dodge Barrow charge. Barrows through a random distant player to the other side of the arena, inflicting physical damage, knocking back all players in its path. At the end of the path, they erupt on the earth, inflicting physical damage, heavily knocking back nearby players before casting impale at a random distant player. So it probably is one of those things where it has a channel time and you start knowing where it will start burrowing towards. Everybody moves away from where it's burrowing towards because of the drop off damage, I think this one, the 1 million physical damage. And then immediately after it erupts, it will then impale. So you just need to kind of track who is targeted on the impale and move away. Standard beetle fight. Infestation. Anoop Zek calls upon a swarm to feast upon a random player, deals nature damage over time. So this is just a dot that the healer needs to watch out for. Once they're finished, they form into a ceaseless swarm and hunt for more prey. So my guess is this swarm needs to be DPS down. So it kind of latches onto someone and you need to DPS the swarm. That's my guess. And, as, and the swarm will continuously work on the player that the healer needs to watch out for. So ceaseless swarm here. The swarm prowls the arena to devour Anub Zek's enemies. Every one second, they are in contact with a player they leave festering wounds. Yep, there you go. So you need to swap over and DPS the swarm that attaches to players. Eye of the Swarm and 100 energy, a massive swarm covers the arena, forces all players into a close range fight into Anuk Zack. While outside the safety zone of the Eye of the Swarm, players gain two stacks of Caesar Swarm every one second. Meanwhile, Anuk Zack will constantly cast Impale and Infestation to slaughter their foes. So I think this is something where you need to fight Anuk Zack in some form of close arena when it kind of swamps the entire arena. So probably like a DPS check, break a shield, and then you get out of the face. That's my guess. It summons these bloodstained web mages that spawns every 15 seconds. They will cast web wrap and cases random targets in webs, roots them in place, increases nature damage. I think this is interruptible. This is my guess. And it only spawns on mythic difficulty, FYI. So that's Anoop Zack, a very standard beetle fight. And then you have Ki Katal the Harvester. Um, it says a stream of blood workers ferry black blood for Ki Katal the Harvester. When struck, they drop their slime cargo and flee. So it's quite clear that these blood workers are ads. Kill them. They drop their cargo. Spawns the black blood puddles you need to avoid. When the boss reach 100 energy, it pulls everyone in. Does a massive detonation called Cosmic Singularity. So you just need to run out of the 10 yard radius of the boss in order not to suffer this one hit KO. And I think the roles are very similar, so nothing to read here. Abilities wise, we kind of covered this. Kill the ads. They drop the black blood. Standing on black blood is very bad, deals damage. Also, if you step on black blood, it roots 
a target, it encases you, I think, and then it can be destroyed to free the player. Now, on Mythic difficulty, Black Blood is absorbed after a single player steps in it. I wonder if there's a mechanic that requires you to absorb it. We already know Cosmic Singularity is the detonation that sucks you in. Players struck by Cosmic Singularity have their essences partially dissolved, reducing damage done by 75%. So this is a very bad idea, right? Naturally, you should never get hit by Cosmic Singularity. Just run away. Movement speed abilities get away. Venom Volley. The boss blasts all players with Venom, inflicts nature damage, and deals nature damage over time. Standard healer mechanic here. Interruptible. Okay, so, well, make sure you kick. Interrupting webs. Erupting webs. They cause several spider web eruptions to occur, inflicts nature damage, and stuns player. I think this is definitely avoidable. Swirlies on the ground, just move away. So that's basically the three bosses. Let's look at the loot. So this is the entire loot table. Um, there's two-hand stuff, a sword, war glaives, dagger, so you can get weapons from here. There's mail, there's ladder head, shoulders, back, chest, wrist, various hands, waist, legs. I won't go through the secondaries because all these are pointless, right? Let's talk about the trinkets, these three specifically. Trinkets, this is the exciting part. Um, the first one is Arakara Sack Brute. This is a haste trinket. All your abilities have a chance to stir the sack, releases an egg that grants you 922 strength. Each egg hatches after one minute, and the new brute attacks your next target, inflicting 60,000 nature damage over time. Wait, hang on, so this is a haste strength trinket. I guess it's only good for melee strength DPS that prioritizes haste. I am quite surprised. I thought it would have been something like a haste trinket that gives your primary stat. So the fact that they limit it to melee DPS strength base is surprising to me. Maybe it's just a tooltip that needs to be changed, but just FYI. Then you have Ceaseless Swarm Gland. This is a strength or AG trinket. On equip, it releases pheromones that attract ceaseless swarms surrounding you with a high chance to retaliate against attackers, inflicting nature damage over six seconds and reducing damage dealt to you by X amount. Oh, this is a tank trinket, clearly. So it gives you kind of a, like a taunts effect where you reflect damage and also a bit of damage mitigation passively. This will definitely look good on the meters, right? Because every time you have those kind of tank trinkets that passively gives you a shield, it just naturally just looks good on the healing meters. The problem is it's not on use. And I think as a tank, you want consistency in terms of when you get your shields. And this is proc based. So not the best tank trinket, but I think as a starter item, decent. Harvester's Edict. Edgy or Intel Trinket, this is clearly DPS. Um, equipping it, your spells and abilities have a chance to summon Blood Worker to deliver volatile black blood to your target. Explodes for shadow damage split between enemy impacts. Intercepting the delivery allows you to siphon power, increasing your mastery for 15 seconds. Okay, interesting trinket. I like that you have the optionality of letting it explode or you can intercept it and gain mastery. So for mastery heavy specs, might be an interesting one. Adds a bit more of a mini game while you're doing uh, your rotation and whatnot. So that's Arakara City of Echoes. Now let's cover Cinderbrew Meadery. And this is one of the dungeons that we got to cover in the alpha closed. And there's already a dedicated video on this channel where I play through the entire Cinderbrew Meadery. So you can check it out in the description. But let me show you some exclusive screenshots from the media toolkit. So this is called Cinderbrew Meadery. Naturally, you will see barrels behind that kind of stores well, meat or alcohol. The kind of lighting here is a bit reminiscent of the mother load lighting, the street lighting here. Some people who tested the alpha alongside me in the close alpha as we did the dungeons also said that this is reminiscent of Stormstout Brewery in some sense. And as expected, when you talk about breweries, there's naturally equipment that allows them to kind of refine the meats and produce the alcohol, right? And these are basically the ads that you need to kill that basically are attending to the machines. The source of the meat comes from these bees that are also ads and you can do a massive pool in this room if I remember correctly. But you can see yeah, the color palette is very reminiscent of like a bit of an insectish vibe because of the bees. And you see a lot of cacks on the ground that kind of stores all the meat that they produce. And if I'm not wrong, this is the final boss area. But anyway, watch the dedicated video and you will understand. But yeah, there's a kind of a locker vault behind this boss area with like gold piles below, probably from all the sales they made from selling all the meat. But yeah, let's talk about the bosses first. The first boss is Brewmaster Aldrier. Harnesses explosive power of Cinderbrew, assaulting players with Blazing Belch and throw Cinderbrew. Blazing Belch is a fiery belch. It's a conal you need to dodge. Very simple, move away. It does throw Cinderbrew. It tosses this brew at random players, deals damage over time. The impact of the hot Cinderbrew forms a part of hot honey. And we'll get to that in a bit. Actually, we can just read it here. Hot honey is a pool of hot honey, forms on the ground for a minute, deals fire damage, reduces movement speed, just move away from these. Upon reaching 100 energy, 
the boss does happy hour and causes thirsty patrons to unleash a rowdy yell. So, so from the entire dungeon I did, at 100 energy, he jumps to the front. He becomes, he doesn't take any damage and he starts serving all these beers. Thirsty patrons have rowdy yell. Where they slam their table, they do physical damage to players and they reduce haste by 25% as long as they're thirsty. The only way to stop this is to bring them a mug or cinder brew. So you need to collect the cinder brews on the table and then you run off to the patrons and just throw it onto their table and that satisfies them. Now that I read the tooltip, the dungeon makes way more sense because I did it blind, right? So I didn't know what I was doing in the, in the playthrough. But we didn't die, so that's what matters. Apparently, after the conclusion of Happy Hour, where you stop the intermission, you serve the patrons, there is Crawling Brawl that appears. And a brawl breaks out for a minute. Players coming into contact with the brawl are pulled in and suffer physical damage. So you just need to avoid, I guess, some AoE. We've already covered this. Yep, nothing new in the Abilities tab. Then we have Ipa. Ipa embodies Cinder Brew itself, assailing players with burning fermentation and spouting stout. So it appears that it blasts multiple players with burning meat, does dot damage, and spouting stout. It expels meat from its body, deals fire damage over time. It flings meat droplets at targeted locations, inflicts 1.8 million fire damage. Some of these droplets form into brew drops, which I think are ads you need to kill. Watch out for brew drops making their way to Ipa or they will fill her up. Yeah, so you gotta kill the ads before Ipa consumes the brew drops that's moved towards the boss. If it consumes them, it inflicts AoE white fire damage, grants the boss a shield that is 20% of its max health. Defeating all these brew drop ads will cause them to spawn oozing honey. It inflicts fire damage over time, reduces movement speed to players. The honey shrinks over time, causing the brew drops to reform once it dissipates. So it's kind of a ads die, ads revive kind of reiteration on this boss. So ads management again. Tanks will note the bottom's upper cut that is a tank buster, pop defensive, and then healers just need to work on healing, uh, spouting stout and burning fermentation. Looking at the abilities, I don't think there's anything new, but I just quickly check here. So it appears that the ads will revive after 20 seconds after you kill them. Upon reaching 100 energy, the brew drop movement speed is increased by 300%. So this is kind of a soft and rage. You gotta kill them fast, else they speed up. This burning fermentation dot is a magic effect, mass dispellable it seems. So priesties, you might want to take note. Let's move on to the third boss. And we have Bank Busby. The boss distributes royal jelly during snack time, attracting fire bees. So the boss summons barrels of honey. Impact inflicts 2 million damage to players standing underneath them. So you just need to move out of it, it seems. And this aroma attracts a ravenous fire bee every 30 seconds. If you defeat the fire bees, they become docile enough to be mounted by players and will charge for a bee haul command. So you can mount the fire bees and maybe extra action button you charge forward. The force of the collision will shatter any honey barrels in its path. And I'm assuming you can break the barrels for something. And we will know in a bit. Anyway, tanks. Honey marinade drips off targeted players on expiration, creating pools of flaming honey that inflicts fire damage. So this is probably a targeted ability. You need to move away, drop your puddles so you don't kind of flood the arena with these puddles. Damage dealers at 1 HP, Ravenous Fire Bees become tame enough to be ridden by players, so this is clearly a DPS mechanic to ride the Fire Bees. Snack time barrels are shattered by the impact of a Ravenous Bee. So I'm starting to think that you shatter the barrels for a reason. We'll get to that in the abilities. For healers, Fluttering Wing inflicts moderate nature damage, so this is unavoidable damage it seems. The boss will flutter its wing, summons a gas, does unavoidable party-wide damage and kind of pushes back players. Ravenous Fire Bees also dart between random players with Shredding Sting, Afflicting them with a bleed debuff. Okay, so this is something that the healers need to top up off, can obviously be bopped off and stuff like that. Look at abilities though. Let's see what those shattering of the barrels actually do. Doesn't really say, it just says it charges, shatters the barrels. There's a new ability here though. Buzz B coats target with flammable honey. We know this already. After 5 seconds, player ignites, deals fire damage. Flaming honey remains on the ground. And on mythic difficulty, the ravenous fire bees standing within the effect will become honey gorged. So I wonder if the tanks need to bring the fire bees here. Because honey gorge lets the fire bee binge on the honey, heals them. The sugar high increases their haste by 50, cause them to become immune to crowd control. Okay, so it's the opposite. You cannot let the ads be near the honey puddles. If not, they kind of get buffed and you can't stun them. Other than that, we already covered fluttering wing, healer mechanic, AoE heals. Let's cover the fourth boss, final boss, Goldie Baron Bottom. The boss used spread the love to launch cinder brew bombs into the area. Goldie's weapon attacks can set nearby cinder brew bombs alight. Upon reaching 100 energy, Goldie casts Let It Hail, detonating any remaining cinder brew bombs. Very reminiscent of the BFA Told the Gore third boss fight, where you need to manage fire bombs and stuff like that. Let's read on. 
tanks, let it hail, detonates any remaining Cinderbrew bombs. So the idea is that if you watch the video on the Cinderbrew Meadery playthrough on this channel, you want to destroy all the barrels as much as you can before this intermission of 100 energy where it blows up all the Cinderbrew bombs because it spawns wave of fires that you need to dodge from each barrel that is left unattended. The boss also does Cindering Wound and I think this might be a AoE thing. Yup, it's AoE thing. Explosion from the bomb causes players to burn and it actually stacks. So yup, you can't have too many barrels available because they would just add to this insane amount of stacks that is unhealable. So, Cash Cannon ignites nearby Cinderbrew bombs, causing them to explode. This is a frontal, so the tank needs to position the boss to get as many bombs off as possible or ignite as many barrels as possible using the fire frontal. Okay, very similar to BFA Toad, the Gold third boss, if you guys did that. Damage dealers, the only new ability here is burning ricochets, bounces to nearby players and Cinderbrew bombs. So I think um, what players need to do is they'll get a debuff and you can see this in the dungeon video as well. You get a debuff, a circle on you, you got to run to the barrels, drop it off on the barrel and it basically fires off the barrel. If you look at abilities, let it hail, we already know. Cinderboom, detonates everything, inflicts fire damage. So this is one hit KO it seems. Cinder wounds. The explosion for Cinderbrew bombs causes players to burn, deals fire damage and stacking. This is dispellable, magic effect it seems. Spread the love. Storms the ground, causes several Cinderbrew bombs to fall into the room. That's how it spawns them. Burning ricochet arcs a bullet off a spinning coin at random players. Then it bounces to other players within 5 yards and bombs. So you don't want it to bounce to other players, but you do want it to bounce to other bombs. So drop it off on the bombs. Cash cannon. This is the frontal the tank needs to position to destroy the barrels. So that's all the bosses. Let's take a look at the loot. You have weapons, which is two-hand mace, two-hand staff. It's an edgy stuff, it seems. One-hand edgy mace, one-hand axe, there's strength. Intel dagger, one hand. This caster offhand. You have a male cap, some cloth heads, a neck, shoulder slot, shoulder slot, cloth shoulders, cloak, more chest, wrist, hands, waist, feet. Okay, a ring doesn't do anything special. Let's read the trinkets. Cinderbrew Stein occasionally shares a drink with allies who assist you in combat, grunting them primary stat for 15 seconds absorbs damage. You take a sip, grunts strength, absorbs damage. When you fall below 50%, you take an emergency sip. Uh, tank trinket, very bad. The reason why it's very bad is every time you have trinkets like that where the moment you fall below 50% health, you proc, it's terrible because there are just some fights that's inevitable where you proc less than 50%. It doesn't mean you will die. It doesn't mean you're in danger. It just means that, well, there's a lot of damage coming in. So... Unused trinket is always bad when you have all these random stuff like occasionally, it's just a bad tank trinket. Also, base stats are missing. I think this is just a tooltip thing that they will fix. Not a great tank trinket. We need more unused stuff. So Blizzard, hopefully you're listening. Another trinket, Ravenous Honey Buzzer. This is a strength edgy trinket on use. Calls Ravenous ally right off into the sunset. Wait, what? Inflicts fire damage split between enemies you ride through. Ah, so you use this and then you fly through the air and it deals damage in a path. Mm. Not a fan of this because you lose uptime on the boss, I think. Synergistic Brutal Realizer. This is an Intel trinket. Spells have chance to charge the device and request a backfill barrel near your target's location. Damage the barrel, cause it to explode, splits damage amongst people. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about this. I think you need to swap to the barrel to cause it to explode. Might be good and it might be a fun mechanic, but might be also tedious. I think some people prefer the fire and forget kind of trinkets where they don't have to micromanage mini games like that. Time will tell. And then we have Dark Flame Clef. Now, I'll be honest with you, the screenshots here, I'm taking a guess. Blizzard gave us exclusive screenshots for seven dungeons only in the media kit. So I'm kind of mixing and matching and guessing. I might be wrong, but it still gives you a good vibe of the new dungeons, right? So let's go. So Dark Flame Cleft, from everything you read, has got to do with kobolds and candles. Now Blizzard weren't too explicit which dungeon photos corresponds with which dungeons. They didn't name it that way in the media kit. But I'm going to guess it's this one. It's the one with kobolds and candles. And later on, when we talk about the bosses, you'll see why. So yeah, very reminiscent of kobold areas. There's like all these kobolds with a kind of a have a sack behind them. There's candles on the ground. There's railway tracks that's abandoned. This is probably a boss arena with the mine cuts that you need to deal with, some mechanics and add spawns. Different pillars, maybe you can line of sight and you can see a nice touch. A lot of candles towards the side over here. This is what the bosses you need to deal with. Again, reminiscent of the candlelight theme that you need to deal with. Boss uses some form of shadow or void magic here. 
And then this is a candle boss. This is a boss that is definitely rooted to the spot. So I guess tanks need to be in close proximity. And I'm sure the different candles here, they kind of do something. You need to kind of use them. But it seems like the bosses all have their own arenas, judging by these two bosses. And that's pretty much all the photos we've been getting for this Cobalt Dungeon. Let's talk about the bosses. So you start off with Old Waxbeard. Summons endless wave of kobolds and deadly minecarts. He marks priority targets for his allies with for the candle or spurs wick into a reckless charge towards a distant player, devastating players and kobolds alike in his path. So he summons kobolds and minecarts and he marks people with for the candle. So this is a candle he throws at someone. The burning wax inflicts fire damage and it fixates minor kobolds. So everyone will start tunneling for the target. Healers probably need to spot heal the target. And then there's Reckless Charge, where Wick, which is one of his adds, will charge the furthest player. The attack knocks back, inflicts physical damage to anything in his path. It triggers a cave-in, fatal to menial labors, laborers. So damage dealers need to control incoming kobolds. They are them into danger to prevent your party from being overwhelmed by too many stacks of crude weapons. So it seems like the kobolds can cast this stackable physical damage and you need to control them. Old Waxbeard Regulus Charge results in cave-in and it drops boulders above each player and the minecart zipping around all instantly to kill other kobolds. So you will spawn cave-in, right? From this charge that you probably need to bait to the wall. Spawns cave-in, swirlies on the ground that you need to bring the kobolds onto the swirlies to kill them. This is my guess. So yeah, Tank says, control incoming kobolds, lure them into danger, prevent party from being overwhelmed. Waxbeard's pickaxe chop increases physical damage taken for a brief period of time. Tanks need to pop a defensive, I think this thing stacks. Healer spot heal, whoever's being targeted by the debuff luring candle flame. Take a quick look at abilities here, see if there's anything new. You have rock buster, it pierces the current target armor, a pickaxe. So this is a tank buster, pop something, defensive. Call to arm, summons his kobolds, I think, and it's by foot or minecarts. Minecarts knock back and inflicts damage. Menial laborers that swarm into battle are equipped with crude weapons. So these are menial laborers that will be killed by various abilities that the boss use. So you need to friendly fire to kill these things. It looks like they randomly go and hit players and they stack physical damage on people. Boss also does underhanded track ticks. Occasionally, while casting Call to Arms, Cobalt sneakily rolls into a dynamite cut onto nearby tracks if not destroyed or explode. So you need to swap, hard swap to the dynamite cut, see which cut needs to be destroyed, basically hard swap. And that's it for the first boss. Let's cover the second boss, Blazicon, and all placeholder attacks. So I think it's easier if we just read the abilities. Wick Lighter Barrage targets three random players, unleash barrage of fireballs, deals fire damage within six yards. Fireball ignites candles. Blazicon targets four players, summons two tornadoes to chase them. The tornadoes extinguish candles. He also does wax eruption, resonates with all candles, cause already lit candles to melt, cause magma pools, inflicts fire damage. So I think the idea is that you do want to light them with the fireballs and you don't want to kite tornadoes through the candles because it extinguishes them. And when the boss uses wax eruption, all the lit candles will disappear and form fire puddles. The boss will then do Enkindling Inferno. It becomes enraged when the players are extinguished. Unleashes fiery burst towards each extinguished candle, igniting candles and inflicting fire damage. Hmm, I think this is a soft and rich mechanic, so I'm not sure how it interacts with Wax Eruption. Maybe it's an intermission that you need to pop defensives for. Blazing Storm invokes the power of a candle when no enemies are in melee combat, inflicting... Oh, okay, so this is a tank mechanic. Just the boss is rooted based on this. So you just need to make sure there's always someone in range, or rather the tank should always be in melee range. Next up, you have the Candle King. And the Candle King makes waxen statues that burns its foes. He used the power of Dark Flame to imbue his abilities, assaulting players with Dark Flame Throw and Dark Flame Pickaxe. So throw Dark Flame, marks random players, hurls flames at them, inflicts shadow damage, absorbs healing on them. So healers probably need to heal through this heal kind of shield. Flames are strong enough to melt wax creations. So you probably need to use this debuff and run through the waxen statues, I think. The pickaxe though, it targets someone, collides with the first target it hits, deals shadow damage, and it can destroy wax statues because it shatters it when it touches a wax statue. I think the entire mechanic here is to destroy the waxen statue because they do damage over time. It seems like they burn his foes. So you do not want to be overwhelmed by statues. You use these two abilities to destroy them. Tanks. EV modes cause fire damage to all players as long as they persist. Yup, so they form wax statues. You need to destroy them. Very clear. This pickaxe does 
high damage and knocks back first target it strikes. I think you need to soak this as a tank because it targets um, someone, right? And then it hits the first target it strikes. So tanks need to pop defensive and soak this, it seems. I think, I might be wrong. Or actually, no, not that I'm reading it. I think it targets random players. Players need to run behind one of the statues and make sure that this thing shatters the statue instead. Yeah, there you go. Abilities. We covered Eerie Mode. There's Curse Wax. Evil Darkness flows from Wax Statue. Player that comes within two yards of a statue causes Wax to flow from it in case the player completely effect stuns the target for 20 seconds. We've already covered this. The boss also does Paranoid Mind, amplifies player fear of the dark, causing them to fear for four seconds. I think interruptible. Yep, this is something you need to kick. Very simple, else you get feared. And it throws dark flame at people that can destroy wax creations. Final boss, the darkness. It enreaves the area in smoldering shadows, reducing combat abilities of anyone without a light source, uses a variety of shadow attacks to devour foes and weaken the light. So it says players without candlelight suffers the debilitating effects of smoldering shadows. So there's a candlelight that you need to stay in a radius of and it protects you from smothering shadows. But being in the candlelight reduces the heat level of the candle over time. Players can pick up and move the candlelight source. So it sounds like you need to move across the platform and juggle the light source. Do not take damage from this smoldering shadows where you would deal basically no damage or healing. Target someone with Umbro Slash, and it's a line attack. You just need to avoid it. Reduces the candlelight's heat, so target cannot have this hit the candle. Boss also does Shadow Blast, targets player. After six seconds, shadows erupt and deals 10 yard radius damage. If this hits candlelight, reduces heat. So yeah, avoid putting stuff on the candle you're using. For damage dealers, Darkness will use Call Dark Spawn. These are ads. They will approach the light and cause drain light. So you need to kill the ants before they touch the candle you're using. Let's read on to ability, see if there's anything new. If you deplete your candle heat, darkness reefs the area in gloom, inflicts shadow damage, also increases their damage taken by 10%, reduces haze by 10 minutes, effects stacks. So there's a penalty for not doing mechanics. It also does wax lump. It holds a lump of wax gathered from a dead candle barrel to restore heat. Ah, so this is how you restore heat. You need to kill the ant. The boss will then, you know, take the lump of wax and then Restore heat to candle. Although I think this is probably done by players, not the boss. It does um, AoE damage. Eternal darkness pulses. This is a uh, healing cooldown time. Interruptible attack calls dark spawn. Oh, okay. You can interrupt this so it doesn't spawn more ants. These things will attempt to snuff out your candle, kill them. And we already covered this. Okay, so on to loot. As always, there is weapons. Two hand pull arm, one hand dagger. Another one hand dagger. This is an intel one. Strength X. Offhand caster, head slots, shoulder slots, cloak, wrist, hands, you name it, waist, finger. Doesn't do anything special. Haze verse ring. Let's talk about trinkets. Burin of the Candle King. Intel trinket carves a wax copy of your target, absorbs 50% of their damage taken. Absorption heats up the wax, causing it to melt after absorbing X amount of damage. Yeah, I don't know about this. Um, it's a stat stick, which is great, but you need to cause it to absorb X amount of damage before it blows up. I don't know if it's worth it. Also, it absorbs 50% of the damage taken. Maybe it's not absorbed, but it kind of mirrors. So you do damage to your target and then 50% of that is kind of also mirrored on this thing. It would be very bad if the target you're targeting actually takes 50% less damage. So I doubt that's the intention. Time will tell whether this is good. Then we have carved black seconds wax. Intel trinket again. Spells have chance to imbue wax. Cause it to form blazing candle, increase your verse, further increase by 405 while you remain within its light. Oof, I don't know whether casters will like it because you gotta stay within that patch to gain additional verse. Yeah, anything that requires you to kind of stay in an area, I don't think people like it. Generally, these kind of trinkets are not well received, but we shall see. We have Conductor's Wax Whistle, edgy trinket. Attacks have a chance to hurl a cut towards target, sends, sending a troop that collides with enemies, inflicting physical damage split between enemies impacted. So, so it's a frontal thing. It's not an on use, it's random prop. So you gotta be always watching where you're pointing. Might be very finicky to play with. I don't think people will like this. Remnant of Darkness. Um, don't know what stat this gives, but abilities have chance to call darkness, increase strength, so we know it's a strength trinket. Upon full power, darkness unleashed, deals shadow damage between nearby enemies over 15 seconds before fading back into its remnant. So 
you can probably time this. There's like weak auras to track the timer of this, right? Or rather the stacks of this. Actually, no, you can't time it because your abilities have a chance to stack. Again, don't know how I really feel about all these random procs, but probably a decent strength stat stick. This is my guess. Tooltip is probably not complete yet. Next up, we have Pyre of the Sacred Flame. So there's a lot of reason to actually love this dungeon from the Alpha Media Toolkit they gave us. Right, exclusive screenshots you see here. Now, as part of the close alpha, we got to kind of hear from Eon ahead of time about some of the favorite dungeons that the team likes. And this is actually one of the dungeons that was highlighted in terms of aesthetics that they put a lot of work into. And you can tell, right? High ceiling, very grand, gothic, castle, medieval kind of vibes. This crystal here, there's a reason, well, not really crystal, but this kind of orangey hues, there's a reason for that. We'll get to that. But you also see light source coming in from the top, the ceiling. And the reason why I'm excited is because we know we're traveling into the depths of this expansion. And whenever you think about traveling deeper and deeper into a zone, the question is, wait, it's going to be very claustrophobic. There's no light source. But as we already know, there's one particular zone where there'll be an artificial light source. And we know this light source toggles between light and darkness, like a Naru crystal of sort. Don't know the law behind it. It's called Hollow Fall. So my guess is this is where the dungeon is situated. And I like the fact that we have some lighting coming in. Um, in an otherwise underneath kind of terrain. Steps leading up to the brand new area, you know, carpeted, reminiscent of a human civilization. Another part of the sanctum, you can see there are human knights, probably ads that you need to deal with, probably some spellcasters, they're kneeling in front of, maybe it's like a boss. And this is like another further steps up the castle that kind of maybe leads to another area. Again, you see another banner that's very reminiscent of maybe the civilization that kind of, you know, relocated or was kind of found in this area. There's a lot of interesting lore, by the way. I won't spoil it for you folks. Another angle of them kneeling in front of those two dudes on top of the platform. And you can see again, the, the, the orange hues, crystal-ish vibes over here. Another look at the majestic dungeon. This time around with more braziers that's being lit. And yeah, more lighting sources, as you can see. And a bit of fire elementals or light elementals, I think. Not fire elementals, light elementals. Another angle of these people praying. And yet another angle. I don't know why they gave us so many screenshots of this, this particular angle. <laughs> and then um, this is probably like mini bosses that guard the final area, it seems like. This is clearly a melee. Melee, you know, they have all these things that probably do some for a tank buster, I think. <laughs> And then there's an outdoor area. This is part of the same dungeon. So you can actually see the Naru, the light and dark crystal at the back, right? There's juxtaposition against this kind of um, outdoor area. So I really like this because of this juxtaposition. So there's an indoor and outdoor area part of this dungeon. And there's a lot to be excited about here. Some close up of this outdoor area. You can see some patrols on mounds. And these are clearly humanoids you need to deal with. I really like the vegetation, the trees. Uh, there's kind of... Um, a nice contrast against the green here. Very nice color complements here. So let's look at the bosses. The first boss is Captain Dale Cry. Again, three boss kind of dungeon. Captain Dale Cry holds spears that deals massive physical damage and causes targets to bleed. Seems like this is random. Players need to spot heal. I think healers spot heal this physical bleed. Definitely boppable since it's physical damage. Ember damage a target with Savage Mauling until Captain Absorb Shield is broken. So it summons um, Ember, which I think is a lion or something, or pet. It molds the target. Uh, the boss has a shield. Need to DPS the shield to break it so that the face stops. Leos, Captain Dale Christ, trusted guards away and defeat them before engaging him in combat to prevent strength in numbers. Ah, so you probably need to kill like mini bosses. And if you don't, they kind of buff the boss. Very similar to Court of Stars. If you have mini bosses up, they kind of buff the boss. And I guess these mini bosses have their own abilities, I'm very sure. Probably similar to Court of Stars. And you need to kill them and they give a lot of count. That's my guess. Healers need to work on spot healing, whole spear, savage mauling. That's pretty much it. Look at abilities here. The boss itself does savage mauling. We covered this. It does battle cry that you can interrupt. If you don't interrupt, it unleashes intimidating cry. It buffs allies and increases their energy by 50%. So probably includes the ally Ember over here, I think. Um, it also pierces the armor of its current target. So this is a tank debuff they need to deal with. It's a bleed that stacks. So tanks need to pop a cooldown. Probably stacks reset naturally during the intermission when Ember comes around and jumps around. The trusted guard, this is basically the loyal defenders, right? So I think these are mini bosses. You can see they named the mini bosses. 
Elena Amberlance, Sergeant Shane Mail, or Tainer Dual Mall is additionally dealt to others. Yeah, so you can see I was right. Mini bosses have their own abilities, very similar to Court of Stars. So this Sergeant smashes ground, move out of the AOV, I guess. Does lunging strike, inflicts physical damage within five yards, adds a bleed, all avoidable. Elena Amberlance, Holy Radiance is a healer mechanic, calls light and heals all players within 100 yards. So this boss does a heal. I don't know whether it's interruptible. Actually, no. This boss does AoE damage to everyone. Healers need to pay attention to this AoE damage and heal. It does Divine Judgment on its tank. Tank Buster basically increasing all damage taken by 25%. Not sure if it's stackable. Probably not since it's 6 seconds. But tank needs to pop cooldowns. Does Repentance as interruptible. It incapacitates someone for 8 seconds. So make sure you kick this. Probably need a kick rotation of sort. Tanner Duomal. Does Ember Storm. Does Fire AoE damage. Swirly is probably need to dodge. Cinder Blast that you can interrupt. Launch Devastating Cinder Blast. Stuns 5 seconds, deals a lot of damage. Make sure you interrupt this. Fireball does a lot of uh, targeted damage, interruptible. Probably prioritize Cinder Blast, have a rotation for Fireball. That's probably how it works. And then you have Baron Braun Pike. So it does dominate the Jailer. Wait, this must be a placeholder. Let's read abilities here, yeah. Placeholders. No Jailers, that's Shadowlands. Okay, um, this Baron, what does he do? Vindicative Wrath. Empowers himself with the light, increasing physical damage inflicted by 25%, empowers each of his spells. So basically, he buffs himself over time. He does Castigator Shield, does Holy Damage, reduce movement speed, affects three total targets. I think it bounces. All players hit by the shield triggers detonation. If Baron Brompa is empowered with Vindicative Wrath, the first ability, the Castigator Shield affects five players. So you don't want him to buff himself, I'm quite sure. Question is, how do you stop this from going off? He does Burning Light, unleashes Burst of Holy Light, inflicts Holy Damage to all enemies within 50 yards, and does Holy Damage over time. Burst of Light heals the boss. If empowered, Burning Light cast is halved. Okay, so everything goes back to this. How do you stop this? Hammer of Purity. Calls Light from Sky, targeting player. Deals damage to the area. Creates hammers that spiral out of the point of impact. Dodge hammers, I guess. Again, boss can be empowered. And this Hammer of Purity will hit five players. Sacred Pyre. Creates pyre containing three charges of sacrificial flame that persist for until cancelled. Each time a player comes into contact with the sacred pyre, consumes a charge, applies sacrificial flame, deals damage to them. Unleash pyre is triggered if any charges remain when sacred pyre expires. So you want to collect the charges, else this thing will explode. And every time you pick up the sacrificial flame, it deals damage that the healer needs to top you up. So the timing at which you pick up is important. The question now is, how do you stop Vindicative Wrath? It probably is some form of absorption you need to break or you need to use some form of like fire mechanic here to stop him from empowering himself. This abilities tab doesn't tell you too much, but I will keep you folks posted. Next up, we have the final boss, Prioris Murprey. For healers, the boss inflicts massive holy damage during inner light. It's probably like an intermission phase. This flame empowers inner light, increasing holy damage, inflicting AoE damage over time. Holy flame inflicts massive holy damage to players and nearby allies can be dispelled. Okay, so I think healers need to dispel this. It's probably like a magical effect. Pyrus Murape inflicts increasing holy damage during Embrace the Light until she's interrupted. So it's a stacking damage over time. You need to interrupt the boss. Don't know how you interrupt the boss. You probably need to break through a shield. That's my guess. And then you can interrupt the boss. Um, Tang needs to help control Arathor Devoted using crowd control ability. So these are ads. I guess that spawn, you need to crowd control them. Probably need to hold down the ads with threat as well. Damage dealers. Yep, there's a barrier. I was right. So the boss channels this embrace the light or maybe it channels inner light. But the point is, I was right. There's a barrier of light that needs to be broken. So you need to break through the shield in order to stop the dangerous abilities. So DPS need to swap safe cooldowns for the barrier that the boss uses on herself. Holy Flame inflicts massive holy damage to a player and nearby allies. Move away from uh, people if you have this debuff, I think. Abilities. Barrier of Light. We've already talked about this. Puts a barrier on itself, starts channeling Embrace the Light. While it's channeling, it stacks increasing amount of holy damage, deals damage to people. So it's a DPS check really. Purifying Light. Perch players, inflicts holy damage, leaves puddle of purifying light. Don't stand in it, it's bad. Inner light, eternal flame empowers inner light. Holy flame, 
Target someone, deals damage over time, can be dispelled, magical effect. Holy smite, this is interruptible. This is definitely a kick rotation for sure. Section 18, don't know what it does. Arotor devoted, these are ads. So they spawn, and powered by Sacred Flame, increase damage done by 50%, inflicts holy damage within 4 yards every 1 second. So 4 yards is not very big, but I guess they kind of swamp you and they start running towards you, and you need to try and crowd control them. The overwhelming power of the Sacred Flame drains 4% health every 1 second. So they die naturally, I think, to the Sacred Flame. This is my guess. So you just need to crowd control them. Don't need to DPS them. All right, let's talk about gear. So as usual, there are weapons and everything for different slots, but nothing of special effect. So we won't cover that. Let's jump straight into trinkets, which is the exciting bits. First trinket is Signet of the Pyre. This is a strength, intel, and edgy trinket. On use, raise your Signet to the light, increase your higher secondary stat by X amount to 20 seconds. Your act inspires nearby signet bearers within your party, granting them acts of the same stat. Two minute cooldown. I think this is pretty good based on all the trinkets I've seen so far. Very versatile, good stat stick. I would probably rate this highly based on every trinket I've seen so far. Next one is Bursting Light Shard. Intel trinket, on use two minutes. Summon Bursting Light Spawn sacrifices its health to unleash bursts of light, inflicts holy damage split between nearby enemies while it lives. Depends on how much damage it really does, but it's a good stat stick. Then you have another trinket. This has no stats to it. Advance to 50 verses of inner resilience reading as you are attacked. Probably a tank trinket. Inner resilience increases your armor by X amount, grants your attacks a chance to invoke a ward which absorbs X amount of magic damage. When finished, sifts through the passages to another chapter. On use, you sift through the passages in the tome with increased radiance. This seems interesting. And my guess is passively, it increases your armor as you get attacked. On use, you can trigger increased radiance. And if I'm reading it correctly, it might be an on use shield. And if so, this trigger is very good for tanks because passively, it already mitigates fire inner resilience. And on use, increased radiance, if it is an absorb shield, this thing is bonkers. I think they will be adding the primary stats back in. It currently has no stats to it, so... Maybe they're trying something new where there's an on use and there's a passive, but I think it's decent if they add, but I think this could be potentially something to look out for for tanks. All right, the next dungeon, the Dawnbreaker. And you can see this is kind of on a ship of sort, even maybe an aircraft. And this is a very interesting dungeon because it kind of implies an airship if you read into the bosses in a bit. And again, Blizzard has sent us exclusive screenshots for the dungeon, and I'm gonna just guess, right? Because this is named Airship Dungeon. At least that's what they call it in the media toolkit. So I think these actually correspond. And you can already see you clearly need to go from one airship to another. And it's all taking place in the Halo Fall zone. You know because of this alternating light and dark crystal that they talked about, which I think will be the best zone, by the way. It looks absolutely sick. But there will probably be some form of flying mechanic you need to use. It's very clear from this. Kind of reminiscent of the airship gunship battle in uh, ICC if you guys did that raid back in Wrath. Um, again, another shot of the airship that is flying around and this is a dungeon. Yes, this is a dungeon. So clearly flying mechanics involved. And then you have one of these bosses that is a Nerubian spider commander lieutenant thing. You can see the airships in the background. So there's probably an air phase where you fly in the airship, a, a phase where you land on the ground and kind of work on bosses. And there's an indoor component, it seems. And you know, this is still called the airship dungeon. So I assume there's different phases to this dungeon. Could be quite cool where there's a flying bit where you fly and then there's a bit where you land. Um, and I'm really quite excited to see this because I think Knockwood was a, a dungeon that they kind of embraced dragon riding back in Dragonflight. And so this will be interesting to see how they incorporate such a mixed dungeon um, in the new expansion. This is probably one of the bosses, it seems. And then this is another screenshot they showed us. This is one of the rooms. Clearly, I don't think, I think this is just for ambiance. Can't be, you need to enter this place to do a boss. It seems way too cramped. But yeah, you can see the same banners here. There's reminiscent of the other Hello Fall dungeon. Some schematics here, some blueprints they're working on. There's definitely a boss room, I think. Maybe this is the basement of the airship that you came from. And I think there's a boss you need to fight in this basement of the airship. This seems like a, a round table of sort. So I'm not sure whether the boss, you know, would interact at this table, but it does seem like a, a place that is the docks of the basement of the airship. Another angle of the basement of the airship here. You know it's airship because of the cannonballs over here. And these are 
what I presume to be cannons that you can fire. Another kind of shot. This is definitely the entrance, you can tell already. So this is the entrance. It's definitely Hallowfall. Again, that massive crystal that's artificial lighting in the underneath zone, underground zone, um, reminiscent in the background over here. Those are the screenshots. Let's take a look at the bosses. So the Dawnbreaker, let's take a look. So also three bosses. They've clearly taken a hint, I think. They, they, they realize that players like shorter dungeons. So um, good stuff, Blizzard. First boss, Speaker Shadow Crown. Dismayed by the order of Knight's failure to capture the Dawnbreaker, the Speaker Shadow Crown arrives armored to the teeth with powerful shadow magic, probably the Nerubian thing we saw. At 50% and critical health, Shadow Crown Alicia's Darkness comes to destroy players, rips open portals at targeted location, inflicts damage. You probably need to move away from portals, I think. Use Radiant Light to mount in combat and dynamic fly to safety. So it's Something you need to pick up by an Arathi Lamb Lighter or Active Dawn Tower. So you need to get to a place where you can mount. The boss targets the tank with Obsidian Blast. Seems like he would do shadow damage until it's cancelled. How do you cancel it though? Oh, it shares the link between body and soul. So I think the tank needs to pick up his soul. Upon removal, this link dissipates across all players applying Shadow Shroud. Okay, we'll read more later. Collapsing Darkness. Rips open portals. Okay, so we read about this. Rips open portals. Take the flying things to fly away. Avoid all the, you know, shadowy stuff. That's bad. So Darkness comes would essentially kill players aboard the Dawnbreaker. And you need to fly away to make sure that you're safe, right? Over here. Damage Dealer. Collapsing Darkness. We read about this already. Let's read abilities for more hints. So we know when Darkness comes arrives, you need to fly away. Obsidian Blast is targeted at a tank. You need to pop big defensives. Each cast grants more dark power, so I think it hits harder and harder. Collapsing Darkness, move away from the portals and bad stuff, fly away. Burning Shadows shears the link between body and soul. It's a magic effect and it's a healer mechanic. You need to top up the target and whoever has it needs to basically pick up their soul, I suspect. Similar to Theater of Pain, right? Pick up your soul. That, um, Lich boss. Shadow Shroud. So when you remove your link, you get Shadow Shrouded. And Shroud's player's life force in magic absorbs healing, inflicts shadow damage. Okay, so healers need to top up people with the burning shadow, heal through the heal absorb as well. And then it also does Shadow Bolt, does magic damage targeted. Anup Ikach. This is basically the screenshot of the Nerubian boss on the ground. So empowered by his lieutenants, he patrols Merodar, which is probably the land phase of the dungeon. Each grants and benefits from Empowered Might and either Radiant Empowerment, Dark Empowerment, or Terrifying Empowerment to add to his formidable power but remove their contribution upon death. Oh, okay. So there'll be lieutenants around him and they add on to the boss's health and damage. Again, very Court of Stars vibes. Kill the lieutenants first. Um, one of them is Radiant Empowerment. The first one is Bound by Sinister Spellcrafting Enhancing Radiant Decay. Don't know what Radiant Decay does, we'll read into it later. The other one does Dark Empowerment, bound by Dark Magic Enhancing Dark Orb to inflict damage, decrease movement speed. The other one is Terrifying Empowerment, amplifies the damage done by Terrifying Slam to affected players within 100 yards. Okay, so you need to kill all these because apparently they empower the boss's abilities. So the tank and everyone else needs to deal with Terrifying Slam, where the boss blasts a target, knocks them back, deals additional damage to targets within 15 yards. So if you don't deal with this lieutenant, this terrifying slam is buffed, basically. That's how it works. It also targets people at Dark Ops, travel towards target player, inflict less damage the further it travels. So it's a drop off damage, but just don't get hit, just move out. Radiant Decay Healers. This thing outpours dark magic, inflict shadow damage, one second for four seconds, increasing damage by 10% each period. So um, party-wide damage, if you don't kill the lieutenant, it basically does way more damage. That's how it works. So pretty sure that's how it's done. So Terrifying Slam is always on the boss. Knocks back the tank. Don't be near the tank, basically. Then it conjures Dark Orb. This is a sphere that explodes. Don't be near Dark Orbs. Don't be in its path. And if you don't kill the lieutenant, it empowers the Dark Orb. Does a lot more damage. Radiant Decay is probably the aura. It's like a rod thing that healers need to heal, I guess. Empowered Nerubian. So yeah, I was right. There's lieutenants. They are given names. Mini bosses. Ascendant Vitz. Corksia. Corksria. Death Screamer. Iken Tech and Ixkraten the Unbreakable. Defeating them removes this power, and these are the empowerments we talked about. So pretty much Court of Stars mechanic here again. Then we have the third boss, which seems to have phases based on this. There's stage one and stage two and intermission. <laughs> okay, I can already tell this is gonna be a blast. When the Order of Night and the Rubian combine assault wanes, Rashanan emerges from the depths, grappling the Dawnbreaker. Nightfall bombers emerge, hurls Arathi bombs aboard, 
which players can throw Arati bombs near Rashanan to inflict substantial damage. After six bombs, the boss flees across Hallowfall, cast acidic eruption until interrupted. Okay. Use radiant light to mount up and dynamic to keep up. So you need to fly to the boss that interrupted, I think. So lots of things to kind of understand. I think the best way is just instead of looking at the roles, we need to look at the phases. So phase one. We're probably on an airship. Um, adds toss explosives. You can pick up the explosives. If you don't pick them up, they detonate very bad. So make sure you pick up the bomb. Throw the bombs at the boss to detonate the bombs. That's how you damage the boss. As you pick up the bombs, you inflict fire damage on yourself. Healers need to top you up and you get extra action button to toss the bombs. There'll be a poisonous concoction on targeted players. Basically, you want to move outside of the acid puddles. Upon creation, players in corrosion gain acidic stupor where you get stunned. So yeah, just move away from the green bats. Expel web. It spews webs, does nature damage within three yards of impacted location, rooting for three seconds swirlies that you need to dodge. Erosive spray, unavoidable acid damage, healers top up. Intermission. So the boss runs away, right? I think at 50% health. Boss runs away. Um, you need to go to a lamp lighter. You need to mount up on your mount. You need to dragon flying to the boss, which is dynamic flight, and then get to the boss and interrupt. See? Acidic interruption. You need to interrupt this, else like the boss just kills you with its channel. Then once you interrupt, stage two starts. Spinneret strands. It blasts webs at targeted players, does shadow damage within 10 yards, tether the original target and create sticky webs. Okay. The tether does shadow damage every one second, pulling in the original target. So okay, I think everyone needs to swap to the sticky webs if I'm not wrong. Should be. Yep. So I think how it works is it will pull the player that's being targeted with the web, DPS the web to free the player, and it will kind of attempt to drag you through acid pools, I think. Yep. So it blasts target rolling acids and you don't want to drop the acid puddles in the path at which it's dragging people, I reckon. So you need to bait them. It does expel webs. Again, healers need to watch for this mechanic. Maybe avoidable, actually. This might be projectiles. And then it does erosive spray where healers just need to heal with uh, cooldowns. So that's all the bosses. Let's talk about loot. Again, weapons include two-hand pole arm edgy, one-hand dagger edgy, mace, one-hand sword, crossbow, caster offhand, head, shoulders, chest, waist, feet, finger, slots, all the slots imaginable. Trinkets. Edgy trinket. Empowering crystal of Anu Ikach. Edgy and Intel Trinket, sorry. Spell and abilities have a chance to let loose a nascent empowerment from the crystal, increasing random secondary stat. Oh, the fact that it's random, not too good already. It's still a stat stick, so consistent output. Merodal's Toll. Intel Trinket. On use, release Toll of Holy Light. Inflicts damage. Next five allies to attack target, receive blessing. Increase their verse. Oh, this is a healing trinket, I think. Actually, no, this is a generally caster trinket. It, it's a stat stick um, and it's on use kind of damage amp. And it's called a damage amp because all your allies that attack the target will gain the verse buff, right, for 10 seconds. So during the 10 seconds, they do more damage, they take less damage. So I think this is actually best used by healers because they can then control when people take less damage and increase the output to get through difficult phases. I think this is actually really good. Meraldell's Toll might be a really good trinket to keep an eye out for. Void's Pack Stone, Strength Trinket. Your attacks have chance to call to the pack, explode, shadow damage split amongst enemies, increase haste. Your death breaks the pack, causes violent explosion. So kind of a kiss curse. Uh, but I, I doubt the violent explosion really would kill people. I'll be very surprised if it did. But anyway, it's a strength trinket and it benefits strength haste classes. This could even be a potential tank trinket. Now I look at um, the haste, right? Because think about prop paladins, prop warriors, they all benefit from haste. Interesting tank trinket. It's strength only for now. The next dungeon, the Rookery. And there's already a dedicated video on this channel covering the Rookery if you want to check that out. It's also included in my alpha playlist in the description. But let me start by showing you some media kit exclusive screenshots. This is probably one of the first dungeons you will encounter in the new expansion. I think Eon mentioned that during one of the media clips that we got access to. So this is actually located very near the capital city. In fact, it's just beside the capital city of the new expansion. This, this platform is quite interesting. You actually need to take a riding mount to kind of fly across. You can see the playthrough on this channel already. So check that out if you're interested. What amuses me is that this particular building that you need to go to has a giant ass tree on top of it. So that was interesting to me. Um, there's an indoor component. In fact, most of the dungeon is indoor based. This is one of the boss's room that you need to deal with. Um, a bit of a forge master vibe with kind of a blacksmithing kind of forge over here. Lots of earthens that you need to contend with. And it, there's a lot of verticality in the dungeon as well. Eventually, you folks will understand why. And I think there's a dragon boss that is around this arena. Or maybe it's another part of the dungeon. I'm speaking from memory here. But yeah, that's the Rookery dungeon. That's all the screenshots. But again, 
watch the playthrough video on this channel. Gives you a way better sense. But let's talk about the bosses. So the first boss is Kyrios. Assaults invaders foolish enough to enter rookery with lightning infused beak and talent. This is the dragon. This is a hippogriff basically. Um, tanks can use hole in the middle of the room to mitigate damage to the party from unstable charge. Can, this is not too much help, but let's read abilities. It does chain lightning. Spread out, else it bounces. Very standard. Unstable charge. Imbues player with electricity. Upon removal, player releases explosion or electricity that causes damage to players in line of sight. So you need to line of sight, go and hide in maybe one of the pillars or the hole in the middle. Boss does lightning torrent deadly. Flies to the middle of the room. Ah, this is kind of the AOE, not AOE, it's the, the beam that the boss will do that rotates around the room. Think of it as the Temple of the Jade Serpent first boss, right? The beam that rotates. You need to not get hit by the beam. Lightning dash, leaps to a location, inflicts nature damage, knock back player. Then it does storm hard, summons a raging storm above it, periodically causing thunderbolt to strike the ground. Thunderbolt inflicts damage within six yards, swirlies that you need to dodge basically. Again, three bosses. Blizzard has really kind of listened regarding the, the length of certain dungeons, so I'm really glad they have done this. The part of the reason why Tyrannical feels so shitty is because some of these bosses, they just take bloody forever. So three bosses, mm, good change. Anyway, that's Kyros. Let's talk about Stormguard Goren. So Goren assaults players with newly found void energy. Chaotic corruption applies to a player, will bounce to nearby players. Heal its stacks are depleted. Chaotic Corruption is a two second cast. It infuses a player with Void, deals shadow damage, and a dot over time. It then jumps to nearest player and applies Chaotic Vulnerability and Removal. How do you cleanse your debuff then? Anyway, we will find out. Uses Dark Gravity to pull its foes, crush them with Void Energy. You just need to run out of this, I guess. Okay, so Chaotic Corruption explodes for heavy damage upon expiration. So you don't want it to explode, you want it to bounce around. I think you dispel it, if I'm not wrong. We'll read the abilities later. Damage Dealers. Crush Reality smashes down on a player's location, creating Lingering Void. So, looks like Damage Dealers will be targeted with this ability. They spawn a Swally on the ground, a Puddle on the ground, move out of it, and also try and bait them in areas that you don't need the room for. Let's read the abilities. I think it gives us a better sense. So Chaotic Corruption infuses damage over time that shadow jumps to nearest player and applies Chaotic Vulnerability and Removal. On Mythic Difficulty, Chaotic Corruption applies Chaotic Vulnerability upon removal to the player. I think it could be dispelled. Anyway, Chaotic Vulnerability increases damage taken from Chaotic Corruption by 100%. This effect stacks. So you ideally don't want the same person to get a debuff. And then it talks about Dark Gravity pulls people in to do some form of detonation. Then it does crush reality, charges his hammer, leaps into air, crush foes, and it leaves behind void patches. This is probably projectile reality tear that you need to avoid and puddles that you need to avoid. So the question is, are you supposed to let this explode? Unclear from current abilities, but you kind of get a sense of what the boss is trying to do. Void Stone Monstrosity. The Void Stone recently formed once to corrupt and destroy enemies. After breaking through Void Shell, so this 20% of its max health is a shield basically. So once you break the shield, it will launch Storm's Vengeance. It launches its hammer infused with lightning at the Void Stone Monstrosity, dealing 20% of its health. So you need to break a shield to deal big damage to boss. Storm's Vengeance will also break Void Chunks off the Monstrosity. If the Void Chunks finish casting Reshape, they form into Void Stone awaken. Oh, so you gotta swap off to the void chunks that break off the monstrosity, kill the ads, else they reform into bad stuff. Tanks will be targeted with Oblivion Wave, so don't stand near the tank. They need to stand away from the party, else you get hit by Wave Frontal. Tank always need to be melee range, else the boss debuffs everyone very bad. Boss is rooted in this phase, or rather in this entire fight. Healers just need to spot heal, unleash corruption it seems. And the boss will pulse heavy damage, called Corruption Pulse. Let's read abilities. Latent Void, it smashes and does damage. It shields itself with Void Shield. And throughout the fight, as you damage the boss, Void Chunks will happen or to drop from the boss. These are ads you need to kill, else they channel for 15 seconds and they become more ads that is very bad. These ads that awaken pulls energy out of its connection to the Void, inflicts shadow damage every three seconds. Each cast will increase its damage by 5%. Very bad, so never let them transform. A leech corruption needs to be spot healed. Then it spawns swirlies on the ground, very bad. Oblivion wave, wave frontal on the tank, don't stand near the tank. Entropy is a slam. So, oh, this is something that prevents people from kiting away from the boss. So tanks always, this is a tank thing, you need to be in melee range, else it does entropy. Then there's a ally enemy called Storm Rider Vogma, where Vogma launches his hammer infused with lightning at the monstrosity, dealing 20% of his health. Ah, okay, so this is your ally. So you break through the shield and it will deal 
damage via Storm's Vengeance, 20% of boss health. When he throws a hammer, it also rips off the void chunks from the boss that you then need to go and swap to the adds. Electrocuted, the Storm Rider charges up a charge attack and stuns the enemy for 10 seconds. So during Storm Vengeance, it throws the hammer, it stuns the boss for 10 seconds. So I don't know whether there's a damage M phase, but the boss does nothing for 10 seconds here. They get stunned. So maybe save cooldowns. So that's that. Let's talk about his loot now. Again, the typical weapons, two hand maze, two hand staff, one hand maze, one hand axe. All doesn't really do anything special, just stats, right? So I'm just quickly going through all of these because again, they're all just stats. So trinkets probably more interesting. Charge, Storm Rook Plume. Edgy trinket. It's a on use, channels, power of storm, crash down on target location, deals nature damage, split between enemies. On use, pretty okay. I think this is pretty all right. Stats thick as well. This is a crit strike trinket. No primary stat. Your spells have chance to destabilize void, releasing corrupted fragments, retrieving a fragment increases your intellect. Oh, as an intel trinket but the shitty part is you must go and pick out your fragment so in the past these kind of trinkets traditionally don't do well so not great sigil of algerian concordance this is available to strength intel and edgy classes your abilities have a chance to call an other ally to your aid supporting you in combat uh pretty okay because it's a stat stick don't like the fact that it summons this ally don't know what the ally does maybe it's very strong it could be like the ruby whelp trinket that we don't know what it does until like we actually saw it and it was like, oh, okay, pretty decent, right? And then we have the stone vault. Now the stone vault, they use this thumbnail that is reminiscent of Neltheris. And you can see these two dungeons, they haven't finished the artwork because City of Threats is using a uh, Court of Stars. <laughs> so in full disclosure here, Blizzard sent us exclusive screenshots for seven dungeons in the media kit. There was an eighth dungeon that they didn't include screenshots and it's either between Stone Vault or City of Threats. But if I were to guess, the Stone Vault just based on just the boss abilities and what I'm reading and just looking at how the models work versus City of Threats where it doesn't even have boss model, I'm going to guess City of Threats is where they haven't finished or rather it's the least finished dungeon. And so the screenshots I'm going to show you, which is my guess for the Stone Vault might not be 100% correct, but the theme does seem to match up because they use the Neltheris thumbnail, right? And what do these lava thing remind you of? Well, Neltheris. Also, we saw um, some placeholder kind of boss models that is reminiscent of all these golems, uh, the dwarves, forging. The themes are lining up here. And this hallway here also very reminiscent of like the lavas and you see the golems, the dwarves. So I think this is probably an accurate representation of the dungeon. Again, more forge. You see the timber saw model are being used here, maybe a placeholder, but this is clearly the boss arena. Here you have another boss arena using some sort of void energy. Again, lava flowing through the entire dungeon and some uh, stone elementals and their summoners over here. But now let's cover specifically the stone vault. Starting with the first boss, Etna. Earthen defense and neutralization automaton defense earthen work against players and invading Skardins. Automated refracting beam kills attacking Skardin, inflicts major damage to anyone else in the way. Um, it launches a beam and you just need to avoid this beam apparently. It kills the Skardin and detonates any volatile spike that is hit. Let's read the abilities, I think this is way better. So this boss does a beam that is targeted at invading Skardins. It hits the Skardin, detonates volatile spikes. Okay, so let's read volatile spikes first. It creates volatile spikes to erupt from the earth. Anyone moving within four yards of the spike causes it to explode, inflicting fire damage to everyone, knocks back everyone, does a lot of damage. So you can't move within four yards of the spike. So basically don't be near them. And the only way to get rid of them is through this refracting beam. So this denies space, this frees up space, the beam. Boss does seismic smash, punches target with force, deals physical damage. This is probably a tank buster. Afflicts then a seismic reverberation. It then also inflicts nature damage over time if the spell Earth Shield is applied to the target. Earth Shield causes the caster to take 25% reduced damage for 3 seconds. So you can dispel this, but it kind of buffs the boss it seems. Um, and then you have more Rung. It breaks itself to attack players with Crystalline Smash, creating shards. So firstly, when it does this Crystalline Smash, it does AoE damage. And then it fractures off to create shards. And they're loaded with latent energy and inflict shadow damage that pulses within 6 yards. So move away from shards. And it also creates unstable crash when it does this smash. It smashes the ground, unleashes void energy, and I think this spawns a swirly. Sending void fragments hurling towards players. Become empowered by the beyond, taking shadow damage every 2 seconds, gaining 50% increased damage to a crumbling shell for 30 seconds. Okay, we don't really know what crumbling shell does. 
At zero energy, Scamarock bolsters itself with Reclaim. Oh, it's an intermission. So at zero energy, it then retreats and reclaims materials against a shell and it channels Void Discharge. Expels the Void Energy, thus AoE white damage that stacks. Don't get hit by Void Fragment, it seems. Spot heal the Void Discharge. Tanks will be targeted with the Smash. I'm gonna pop a big cooldown. Let's read abilities here. Yep, so I was right, this is a Tank Buster. When it Tank Busters, it then spawns a shard, and I think you want to DPS the shard because it says damage dealer alert. If you don't kill the shards, it basically bolsters the crumbling shell, so more shield on the boss. And if you don't DPS the shard, they explode, they does a lot of damage. So you gotta swap fast. That's reclaim. It draws material from surrounding area, gains a shield. Gotta DPS the boss, break the shield. When you break through the shield, the shell shatters, stuns the boss, stuns him and interrupts casting because if not, it will just channel Void Discharge, which stacks as it starts pulsing more damage. So this is a soft enrage. You've got to break through the shield, stun the boss, and this cancels out Void Disruption. And it does Unstable Crash, it slams, it spawns Void Zones, move away. That's pretty much second boss. Then you have the Forge Speakers. Speakers Brock and Dorlita call on metal and machinery to help them strike their foes down. This is a duo, basically. Brock calls a scrap cube with scrap song and holds it at the players only to be deconstructed by Dolita in her mech suit. So scrap song calls to the metal surrounding him that coalesce into a cube that he sends flying at players and people in his path get stunned, takes damage. This cube is then deconstructed by Dolita, um, who relocates the cube to the middle, charges energy, the cube explodes, deals fire damage and pulsing damage over time. So damage dealers note that the Brock boss will attempt to cast Molten Metal, inflicts damage on people. So you just need to spot heal this on the damage dealers. Dolita targets players with Lava Expulsion, fires a Lava Orb. I think this is dodgeable as projectile. Healers need to heal Molten Metal as I guessed. And you do not want to get hit by the Lava Wave, else you gain a dot the healers need to heal you with. For tanks, it seems like Scrap Song is targeted at a tank so it can kind of uh, position the placement of this. Dolita does Molten Hammer, this is a tank buster. Dolita Deconstruction drags Scrap Cube to the middle of the platform. Let's read abilities. So it does Silent Speaker. The speaker fights on with increased Zealer 3 after witnessing one of his own kill. So if you kill one of the two bosses, the other one gains this buff that gives it 75% more damage. So you want to kill them side by side, I think. Speaker Brock has this thing called Activate Ventilation. Causes them to launch Flaming Scrap to surrounding areas. Standing on the vents deals fire damage, don't stand on them. This vents causes them to expel flames. Don't ever stand on them, basically. Every 0.5 second, Flaming Scrap shoots to the destination, leaving burning ground. So there's fiery puddles you need to avoid too. Dust Molten Metal, where it sends liquid metal surging into targets. Does fire damage, slowing them 50%. Scrap Song summons the cube, move away from the path of the cube. Dolita will then deconstruct the cube. Cube explodes, does damage. Does AOE white damage, basically. When it relocates the cube to the middle platform, it also does metal splinters. It charges energy, cube explodes. So the explosion is called metal splinters. Dolita is the one doing tank buster. Molten Hammer is the tank buster, so pop a defensive. Lava Expulsion fires an orb of lava. This is definitely avoidable, I'm quite sure. On Mythic difficulty, Lava Expulsion removes Flaming Scrap that gets hit. So Flaming Scrap comes from the exhaust vent. So I guess this is a space denial thing and your tank needs to position the, or rather whoever is being targeted by Orb of Lava, Lava Expulsion needs to position such that the orb will travel in a way that hits the flaming scraps from the vents that is summoned by Speaker Brock. That's probably how it works. Okay, next boss, High Speaker Irik. Lots of placeholders here. Let's just read the abilities. Does Void Rift, opens rifts to the Void, pulls in players, kills anyone within three yards. So run away, use movement speed abilities, infect players with Void energy, inflicts shadow damage every three seconds until removed. Damage increases by 25% every three seconds. Moving within 15 yards of a Void Rift will remove the Void Corruption. So you gotta move to a Void Rift. So you can't move too close. If you're too close, you die. You need to move within 15 yards to remove your Void Corruption. That's how it works. Entropic Reckoning. It unleashes Entropy on everyone, deals party-wide damage within 8 yards. Unbridled Void. Fires a cone of energy, inflicts damage in its frontal arc within 45 yards. So this is probably targeted, I think. Just need to position it 
so you don't kind of sabotage the entire party, I think. So that's all the bosses. Let's look at the loot here. Again, the typical, you have all your weapons. They don't do anything special effects. So just stats, I won't cover them. There's a shield that drops here too. And various other slots. Let's talk about the trinkets though. Overclock gear, a rank launcher. No primary stats. Don't know whether that's a mistake. Might add in later. On use, launch the superheated gear rank. Deals damage to enemies, losing heat as it cuts through them. Two minute cooldown. When you equip this, your melee attacks have a chance to crank the launcher's gears, decreasing its cooldown by five seconds, heating up your weapon, which causes your next attack to inflict additional fire damage. So it reduces the internal cooldown, also does a prop for your weapon to inflict additional damage. Um, I don't know whether the lack of stats will hamper it. Without stats, I don't see this being popular. Next one, Scrap Singer Symphony, Intel Trinket. Healing abilities have chance to call the nearby metal to form shield around ally, absorbing X amount of damage. Um, question is how long the shield lasts? The shield reacts explosively to fire, inflicting fire damage on nearby enemies when struck. I'm not too sure about this uh, because it's random, right? Anything random for healers and tanks generally bad, so that's my thoughts. Then you have Skarmorak Shard, which is a strength trinket. Grabs the shard tightly to enrich yourself with crystalline energy, increasing your mastery for 15 seconds. Good for mastery strength classes, I guess. The shard draws in remnant energy from nearby enemies, increasing your mastery up to five times. Yep, so strength trinket meant for mastery heavy specs. That's the stone vault. And then we have City of Threats. And like I said, I don't think there's screenshots provided for this because it's probably not ready for public viewing yet. So Blizzard didn't include that. So let's just talk about the bosses straight away. All right, first boss, Oretta Krixvix. Might have pronounced that wrongly. This is probably a Nerubian dungeon just from the name City of Threats, right? So yeah, it's probably the Nerubian dungeon. Anyway, the boss used Chains of Oppression to force players to fight him in close range as he attempts to terrorize them. Um, so Chains of Oppression binds players. Whenever a player is more than 10 yards for more than one second, inflicts damage and force them back into range. So you gotta be in melee range of the boss, else you take heavy damage. Attempts to terrorize them is something where he unleashes a terrifying screech towards player, inflicts damage in a cone. Okay, so this is probably where he limits the space in the arena. You gotta be in 10 yards to the boss, and then he will fire conos in targeted directions, and you just need to move around in clockwise or anti clockwise to dodge them. This is my guess. Upon reaching 100 energy, it torments players with Vociferous Indoctrination. Torments all players, deals damage one second every four seconds. So it inflicts heavy damage, force them to run from his lingering influence. So you gotta get out of this zone, I think. That's probably how it works. Because it because this indoctrination leaves behind an area of lingering influence, which is a puddle, I think. Boss also does subjugate to tanks. Inflicts heavy damage, greatly reduces movement speed. This is basically a tank buster, you pop something. Healers just need to spot heal voracious indoctrination, I guess. Let's look at ability specifically. Yep, subjugate is tank buster. We've covered this, covered the chains as well. Don't ever get feared through terrorize. If you get hit by the Kono, this is what happens. Shadow of Doubt, it basically infects mines, deals dot damage. Upon expiration or removal, explodes. So this can be dispelled because it's a magical effect, right? So either you dispel or you let it time out, probably dispel. So Verocifer's indoctrination is the one where it forces you to move away from lingering influence. Healers know that this is a uh, party-wide damage, so they need to heal this. Next boss, Fangs of the Queen. Nyx is probably the name of the boss. Unleashes Shade Slashes, while Vix conjures Icicles. Okay, so probably Council Fight, two bosses. Shade Slashes, Nyx slashes outwards, inflicts damage in a cone, leaves behind Echoing Shade. Move away from Echoing Shade, I guess. Avoid Kono. Vix conjures Icicles. Aim Frosted Daggers at players, inflicts frost damage within line of travel. Dagger remains embedded in target, reducing movement speed. So don't ever get hit by the line, basically. Upon reaching 100 energy, Nyx and Vix exchange powers during synergic step swapping positions. So as they swap positions, they deal damage in their path, so move away. Vix then slices away Rim Dagger, which is its primary target. The Frost Daggers explode, applying freezing blood to target, inflicts frost damage to players within 15 yards. So gotta move away from the target, I think. And Nyx steps in the shadow with Shadow Shunpo. Someone has been watching a lot of Bleach. Must be the developer who basically named this ability. Shadow steps to random player, stabs them, physical damage, does damage over time. For tanks, Echoing Shade mirrors previous Shade Slash. This is targeted at tanks, I think. Yeah, so this is a tank buster. So anything Echoing Shade or Shade Slash, just make sure you move away from the Kono, I think. Freezing Blood. This is the one that comes off the Rim Dagger. 
this effect stacks. So you probably want to pop cooldowns on this, I think. Targeted by tanks. Damage dealers. Nyx and Vic share resources with twin fangs, so you can deal damage to either one. Hmm. Dot classes might really benefit in this fight. Players hit by synergic step suffers heavy damage, so move out of the path when they swap positions. Uh, healer spot heal the icicle damage on the target. Duskbringer is where Nyx calls upon a dark, does shadow damage, AoE, Alicia's power, and does party white damage. And then there's also the freezing blood debuff that we talked about, does damage over time. Let's read the abilities, I think it'll be better. So the two mobs or bosses will swap positions and gain different abilities via synergic step. You don't want to be their path when they swap positions. Nyx does Shade Slash. This is targeted at a tank, physical damage, and magical damage in a cone. Leaves behind Echoing Shade. Oh, so this is like AoE into AoE, I think. Unleashes Shadow Slash in their current direction. So the cone widens, basically, I think. That's what it means. Does bring a inflicts damage over time, party wide damage, basically. Then you have Vix that does icicles. This is a magical damage at players. Does damage to all targets within line of travel. Remains embedded, slows movement speed, does dot damage. Healers might be able to dispel this since it's a magical effect. Mass dispel OP. Knife throw. I see knife at person. Deals physical damage and physical damage over time. Then it gains rim dagger later on when they swap positions. This is a tank buster, then puts a freezing blood debuff on the tank. So there's additional stuff for freezing blood actually. So the tank needs to stand with someone. If not, you will take frost damage every one second. So you need to find someone to stack with, that's important. Nyx will then gain Dark Paranoia when they swap positions. Heightens the fears of random players, inflicts shadow damage over time. Standing near allies inflicts damage. So freezing blood means stack with tank. Dark Paranoia means don't stack with people. Um, kind of like the Xavier's mechanic, right? One is stack, one is don't stack. Then Nyx also shouldn't pose in shadow steps to someone does physical damage. That's Fang of the Queen. The third boss, Coagglomation. Void Search, continuously change the save zones. Tanks need to pay attention to boss position assist teammates by engaging in combat within safer areas. So everyone move with tank basically and there's area denial um, and the boss will change the safe zones. For damage dealers, Dark Pulse inflicts significant damage on players. Pop defensive, I guess. Avoid the impact area from Void Search that may cause you to accumulate corrupted coating. So the Void Search is the bad areas, right? So follow the tank, you won't get hit by this. Um, if you do, you gain this corrupted coating. There is a heal absorb that the healers need to top you off for your mistake. Prevent the co-agglomation from acquiring ops. Reasonably allocate the number of ops to block with teammates. Blocking too many ops result in excessive number of stacks of corrupted coating. Ah, okay. This is kind of like knockhood second boss where you need to intercept the ops else the ops will buff the boss but every time you intercept an op you gain a stacking debuff well not stacking debuff unclear whether it's stacking but you gain a shield absorb that the healers need to top you off so you can't go ham and just keep getting all these ops because um you will just die right because of the healing absorb that the healers can't kind of top you off to get rid of healer intensified very clear eyes on teammate who have accumulated excessive number of stacks of corrupted coating healing them promptly to remove corrupted coating um Basically, Dark Pulse will kill you if you got too much healing absorbed. So I wonder if you can just have someone pop immunities and gather all the ops. That'll be very OP. Let's talk about abilities. Um, slime Propagation. Coagglomation hurls slime towards players, reduce movement speed. Upon expiration, slime propagation spreads to player within 6 yards. So don't be within 6 yards. Viscous Darkness. Boss attempts to increase mass, draws ops of black blood from containers. Ops that are absorbed, restores 4% health. This is why you need to intercept them. And you intercept them, you gain this healing shield that healers need to top you off. The boss does void search. This is the area denial mechanic. Boss needs to be moved by the tank to different areas so that you don't need to fight in the impacted area. If you fight in the impacted area, you gain this healing absorb as well. Then it does dark pulse, AoE, unavoidable damage on party, healers to heal. Final boss. Izo, the Grand Spicer. Alchemical transformation has long been central part of Nerubian life. None possess greater passion or greater mastery of this process than Izo. As long as she remains free to continue her pursuit of perfection, Izo has little concern for who she served, to what end, and to what cost. Thus, was born the ascended form, now granted to Queen Ansurek's favorite subject. Izo creates a set of shifting anomalies, then shows off her mastery of transformation with Umbro Weave and Tremor Slam. So it creates a set of anomalies, which is fears or anomalous energy that inflict shadow damage and knocks back player on contact. The anomalies relocate to new positions every 9 seconds, so don't ever come in contact with these things. And the boss seems to transform with Umbro Weave where it assumes a sage form, where it snares players in shadowy webs, rooting them for 12 seconds or until destroyed, probably stack 
an AoE down the webs that spawn on you. It also does Tremor Slam, and then it becomes a Nerubian Lord. It slams ground, inflicts nature damage, and if you're within 12 yards, additional damage. When you when the boss reaches 100 energy, attempts to destroy her target and anyone near them with process of elimination, where it recalls all the anomalies to a location, violently smashing them into her target one at a time, inflicts a lot of magic and physical damage. Okay, so tanks. Note that shifting anomalies inflict damage and knock back players on contact, so don't ever come in touch. Actually, all the roles are the same, except for, except for Splice, which the healer needs to heal. So let's read abilities, it'll be way easier. We know the anomaly spawn, they shift locations, don't get hit. Splice, Ezo injects experimental strands into players, does dot damage that the healer needs to heal. Boss does Tremor Slam, this is something that is unavoidable damage, don't be within 12 yards. The Slam awakens Scarabs that emerge, so these are adds, and the adds will bite enemies putting a bleed debuff. Successful cast of Gorge increases the caster size after gorging five times trigger gut burst where it explodes and deals unavoidable damage, I think. Yup, and it stuns players within five yards. So what you need to do here is that the scarabs that spawn, group them up, AOE stun them to prevent them from channeling too many Gorge because once they gain five stacks, they explode and you probably wipe. The boss also does Umbral Weave to become a Sage and you need to swap to the webs to DPS the webs that spawn on players. And then it does process on elimination. And this is really probably a tank thing because you gotta move the boss from place to place, I think. Or maybe the boss summons anomalies and is a tank buster. Probably, either one. So that's all the bosses. Let's look at the loot. So as usual, you have different weapons, nothing special in terms of effects. There's also a shield, an intel shield from this place, intel offhand, hands, neck, chest, wrist, hands, legs, feet, every single slot. Then we have trinkets, four trinkets. By the way, there's a haze verse ring here might be good for certain specs. We have the first trinket for intels. Zero Concoctory. Your spells have a chance to inspire you to experiment on ally and hunting them in unforeseen ways for 20 seconds. This is either going to be really good or really bad because it sounds like it's random. Unforeseen ways. Totally random. Or they could pull a ruby whelp thing and you kind of commit to something and it always enhance someone in the same way. Or it just amplifies their secondary stat. I'm not sure. But the fact that it's random, not too great. Oppressive Orator's Larynx. No stats. Your attacks have a chance to stir larynx, allowing whispers to influence you. Each whisper flows through your mind 30 seconds, grants strength. On use 2 minutes, wave larynx in the air, unleash chorus, deal shadow damage split between nearby enemies. Your whispers leave to join chorus, increasing its damage before falling silent. Uh, strength trinket with no stats. Mm, not too good. But maybe if there's stats to this, maybe it's good for tanks. Snap aggro here, right? Then you have Twin Fang Instruments, Edgy Trinket. Very long tooltip. Uh, use. Never say cooldown. Two minute cooldown, I think. Open the pouch. Draws Nick Shadow Blades to quickly strike at enemies in front of you. Inflict shadow damage in front. May use pouch up to zero additional times. Placeholder number, naturally. So you can use the pouch again. Additional times. Until cancelled before it seals itself magically to recharge as counter. Preview second strike. Open pouch draws Vix Frost Blade to launch long range attack. Deals frost damage split between enemies it passes through. Third strike draws blade once more to perform both strikes at the same time. I think depending on when you use the pouch, you potentially can use a third strike and second strike and first strike. As for how do you determine which strike you use, I suspect it's a timer and you it's a cycle maybe and you need to time it so that you open it at the right time. A mini game of sort, I think. Might be really good for, I guess, rogues because one of them is frontal, right? In front of you. So like edgy hunters, like it's kind of going to be clunky. Basically edgy, midi DPS, I think could be good. Viscous Coaglum, Intel Trinket. On equipping, excessive healing attract shadow energy to your party, storing energy, restoring target health when they receive damage. On use, you channel the Coaglum's power, directing all current shadow energy to your target. This is really good, I think. Well, not really good, but it's way better than some of the random proc healing trinkets because this one allows you to on use at one minute. So every one minute, you have a tiny charge of heal that you can triage someone, which I think is pretty decent. And so that's basically the preview of all the eight dungeons coming to Mythic Plus in the new The War Within Seasons. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to smash the subscribe button, more exclusive alpha and beta content coming to you from this channel. By the way, the link in the description has a playlist of all my alpha content so you won't miss a beat for the new expansion. A big shout out to Blizzard for including me in the alpha and a big thank you to all the Patreon subscribers that you see on screen. Thank you so much for making my content possible on this channel. And if you'd like to support us via Patreon, link is in the description. 
check out the playlist in the middle of the screen. It contains all my alpha content and I'll see you in the next video.